So uh, I think we need to be up here and check um, check this activity off of service for <laughs> our clubs early in my career. No, I'm excited to be here. I haven't spoken to a live crowd in about two and a half years now. I've just been on the screen. So it's really nice to see facial expressions wave to people oh, on the camera <laughs> um, and tell you about what I do and why I do it. Um, I'll start with today. It's actually kind of a fortuitous day to be up here. Today is the 50th anniversary of a significant life-taking flood in Rapid City, South Dakota. If anybody's from that area in the Black Hills, you remember in 1972, 236 people perished with the collapse of what was built as a recreational reservoir with a very small dam and spillway, massive uh, rain over about 24 hours and communities wiped out. They did not rebuild in that floodplain. The mayor has some amazing quotes about why not to build uh, back in a floodplain. And I, I would love to just put his quotes on my gravestone whenever that happens because he was, he was right on. Uh, NPR is running this story about the Canyon Lake Dam this week. I uh, was actually listening to it on the way over. So if you have a chance to get on NPR and listen to that story, it's very much about where we live and what we do in the Pacific Northwest, as well as the regions that I work in. So for the Army Corps of Engineers, we're gonna start this with, um, with, am I pointing to the right place? Well, I have to share oh, the screen. Julie's gonna share the screen. So we're gonna start with some trivia here, true and false. The National Park Service provides the largest water-based recreation program in the US, true or false? false. I got a thumbs up from Tom. They do? I'm done, I'm done, you know, 50, 50. Oh, got it, okay, <laughs> you're hedging there, okay. Marine Drive, oops, that's supposed to say North, oh, it does say North, Northeast Portland is a flood protection levy. Sort of, yeah. True or true. false? True. Very good, mm -hmm. you can come back to that if you have questions. Fish ladders were originally built into all Lower Columbia River and Lower Snake River oh. dams. True or false? <laughs> Absolutely true. <laughs> Remember that story? Yeah. Bonneville Dam is owned and operated by the Bonneville Power Administration. True or false? Oh, yeah, Tim Wright. Okay. <laughs> so there's a lot of trivia around where we live and what we do. I call the core the no CM agency because you really don't see what we do and why we do it, but it is right here. It's helping keep our lights on. So it's kind of a tongue-in-cheek example. We dredge up sand, not the past. We generate positive vibes with all the electricity. We hold back the water when we need to, and we let it rip when we uh, need to. And we do lots of really cool things. The East Moreland Park restoration, if you go down to Oaks Bottom, you'll see a big restoration program down there for environmental access, um, water coming in from the Willamette to blocked off territories. That's really localized uh, work that we do. So the Corps goes back a long, long way. Um, the first engineer was um, appointed by George Washington on June 16th, 1917. Uh, uh oh, see, I can't see my speaker notes. I'm at a loss. I say 1767 or something like that. So the engineer is actually helped build the roads, the bridges, the fortifications for the Revolutionary War, made a significant name for themselves during the Civil War, and were majorly involved in the building of Washington, D.C. Um, so when you travel around D.C., the canals, the levees, monuments in that area of the East, you will see the course footprint just about every day. This is just a pitch for our workforce. We are talented, bright, dedicated, diverse folks from all over the world that come to work for the Corps. Um, the tall red bar on the bottom are the numbers of engineers, not even negligible in the far, far right of people like me who communicate about what the engineers do. Uh, I'm trying to change that in my career to put communication up a little bit higher. Uh, my mother was thrilled that I took on a career in the engineering field because I thought I could marry and find all these engineers and it would be great. And if he is a bevy of men, there are more than 50% women in our engineering corps. <laughs> so 
okay, it's Portland, right? So they're diverse minds, baby boomers, Gen X, we've got them all. Um, and folks had asked, what is the core and why is it military? Well, it started out as a military installation under the army, but military personnel are out building and fighting the wars and the civilian personnel were here and we were able to support the civil works missions. So we have 34,000 civilian employees and about 800 military personnel in the ranks of the Corps uh, right now across the world. Um, we are also the engineers to the Department of Defense, military bases, barracks, the VA hospitals, um, Afghanistan fortifications, uh, all the forward bases, the transportation routes, the bridges, but the Corps has a hand in all of that across the world. So bringing it a little closer to home, we are um, the Northwestern Division, which is actually headquartered here in Portland, has 5,272 civilians like me and 47 military folks in the Portland district, which is also here, a, a different group has um, about 1,400 employees. So you don't really know, but we are a pretty notable employer across the country. Our divisions are divided by watersheds. Northwestern Division is the Columbia River and the Missouri River watersheds, because that's really how flood risk and many of the other natural features of the world run and flow. And that's how we can organize our civil works program uh, based on watersheds. Massive budget. Um, and just some examples of some of the big programs, the Columbia River Treaty, which Jeff mentioned that I worked on with his neighbor. That is a treaty that manages flood risk and water supply all the way up into Canada. Um, those are major dams that were built by the Corps. On the map are our district offices under Northwestern Division. So Portland District has both the headquarters uh, <coughs> division office and our local office. I work for the Omaha District. Um, I'm not the risk communication manager for the whole organization, but I am for the Omaha District, which is the largest of the Corps District and includes um, 48 dams, if I remember that correctly. Um, yeah, 46 dams in the Missouri, 34 on the Columbia. Most of you probably have never seen most of the little dams. Who's not been to Bonneville? I'll shame you first. <laughs> okay. All right, we're going to get uh, Denny out there. Navigation. That was actually our very first mission. We navigated, uh, we dredged and took out the snags along the Mississippi and Missouri rivers so the little towboats could get up and bring the furs down from the, trap it, the trappers in the 1800s and bring goods, coal, wheat, and other things up the Missouri and the Mississippi basin. So we started really as a, as a navigation civil works organization. Um, 60 million tons of cargo out of the navigable waterways in our division alone. There's a little quote from one of our division engineers that he is actually now the CEO of a multi-billion dollar engineering and production firm, not really a battalion commander. So it is about civil works and building and keeping navigation moving. Um, I'll give you a moment. I think you can read a lot of this here. It's part of an advertising campaign I actually wanted to put on all the big ships coming down the Columbia River, a big sign that said brought to you by the Army Corps of Engineers because people don't know that's what we do. And there's some pictures. The one on the left is the mouth of the Columbia River jetty, which I hope you never go recreate on. Uh, those stones are about 20 tons each. That has to be rebuilt every 40 to 60 years. Certainly Mother Nature takes her course on our jetties. And that is just a bird's eye or actually probably a frog's view of the navigation locks of the John Day dams. If you've ever been out to the Dalles or John Day, you get an idea of the magnitude of those navigation locks. There's our dredge or essayons on the left and there's somebody having fun in dry dock on the right. Um, the essayons went to the Valdez um, oil spill in Alaska and actually turned its suction system upside down so that instead of pulling out sand, it was able to suck up oil and was part of that natural restoration program up there. So we show up wherever we're needed. Hydropower. Was it oil on the surface of the water or? Oil? We, 
it was a, a bit of both at that point because it had started by the time we got the ships up there things had started to settle i don't know if we ever went in and dredged the sediment i think we went back to our regular nav mission at that point um, if you remember well i'll get there in just a minute but navigation is really kind of everywhere here we keep the lights on um 75 billion kilowatt hours um, out of our division and that's enough to power 10 Seattle's um, and it's renewable and it's clean, which is really cool. Uh, we are also a, a leader in environmental engineering, environmental restoration, fish programs, cleaning up the messes we made in the past. We admit much of what we did was not to the best and we've learned and now we're trying to lead the way with restoration programs all over the world, including military bases, oil tanks, that kind of stuff. Um, now, this will bring up the biggest probably question in the room, which is fish. Uh, we can get into that a little bit later. We spill water and we cool water for salmon. The ladders were originally built. That's a ladder at Bonneville Dam on the, the tall vertical one. And that is a newer ladder, although it's not the original. We have an original still. That's an improved ladder back out there at either Ice Harbor or McNary Dam. So we're always looking to improve conditions for fish. Emergency response. So there's some of the oil that we dredged up. Not a real exciting picture. Mount St. Helens, many of you remember when that blew, we were called out to dredge the Columbia River, the Cowlitz River, and many of the rivers that were then basically sedimented in and all of a sudden it washed down. We sent our dredges and contract dredges up there to keep things open. We also built the sediment retention structure and the Spirit Lake Tunnel, which you may or may not know about, but it does help drain Spirit Lake, uh, <coughs> get them back up and become its own dam and then release and collapse. Now, Mother Nature may take its course on that as well. We will not beat a volcano, but we're doing um, as best we can. Uh, outdoor recreation. This gets to that first question that Tom had wrong. Um, <laughs> Uh, that we are the largest water-based supplier of recreation. And can you tell me why you think that might be? Because you're responsible for the lakes behind the dams? The reservoirs that our dams create, correct. Um, I work for the three largest reservoirs in the course portfolio, and those alone bring in 20 million visitors a year or something like that for recreation. That's in the upper Missouri Basin. Uh, the visitor centers, camping, fishing, all kinds of stuff. So is Detroit Dam part of your... Detroit Dam is. Actually, there was a... I think I have a picture of Detroit coming. Detroit was built for flood risk reduction. It's one of 13 dams in the Willamette Valley that we use. You drove to Eastern Oregon, and it's the first time I've seen it so full and so, you know, recreated. I mean, it right. was, it's, it's magnificent. Yeah. So Detroit Dam, most of you know that if you're from Oregon, if you water skiing or camping on Detroit. Um, Detroit, we do not manage for recreation, which people are disappointed about, but um, we do our best to keep it as full between Memorial Day and Labor Day. Um, but we have a job to do, and that's um, reducing flood risk and keeping water in the river for fish. So, uh, so this gets into more of what I do in particular, which is infrastructure risk communication. We reduce risk. Uh, we can never eliminate risk. There's too many other factors that are involved in protecting folks. Um, but we do have uh, flood reduction projects in 44 states, including Alaska and Hawaii. Um, we save billions of dollars in infrastructure, property, levees, homes, commercial businesses every year. Um, the last big, big floods we had in the Missouri were 2019 and 2011. You probably saw lots of pictures of that. The big, last big one we had here was uh, 96, when the Willamette nearly spilled its banks here downtown. So, um, so Lori, to your point, that dam on the right, that's yeah. actually a look from the reservoir side at Detroit Dam. It is lower and we are repairing spillway gates there to help regulate the release um, and levels of water out of Detroit Dam. I threw that in there because you don't really see Detroit low right. like that, where you can actually see the school gates. There's a picture of um, how we saved downtown. We manipulated the water 
from 60 dams to keep the Willamette from flooding Portland. How do we do that? The Corps has authority to manage any, well, I'm not gonna say any, many, many county, state, and federal dams, no matter the agency, we have the authority to start pushing buttons and asking folks and telling folks, depending on how collaborative everybody is during a flood like the one in 96, to hold water or release water so that everything works as one great big system of sinks and bathtubs. Mm -hmm. So you release it here, you lower it there. One reason the Willamette was not draining in 96, the Columbia failure, you know, remember this? Sinks and bathtubs. <laughs> sinks and bathtubs. But Columbia was really high, the Willamette had nowhere to empty. So the court called on agencies of all dams upstream of Bonneville, all the way into Canada, and said, hold as much as you can until the Columbia came down about three days later and the Willamette could empty. Wow. Massive engineering feats, coordination. That was before the computer systems really took off too. So that's one of the things the core can do. So uh, preparing for the future, we also do huge amounts of scientific research. We have modeling labs across the country that model and do estimating and forecasting and engineering design work. Um, we work with STEM programs and universities all over. We take um, interns and have fantastic um, opportunities. And that says, our toys are cooler than your toys. So <laughs> I don't have time today to show you some of our toys. Um, so this is what I do, and I don't know how much more time I have, but I'll make it quick. The dam safety program is critical across the core for many reasons, such as what you heard about with the Black Hills flood 50 years ago. Our primary focus is dams, is the public safety. Um, but dam safety is more than just about the dams. It's about assessing risk, knowing what some of the influencers are that impact with, you know, risk and create a risk environment. What can, uh, what are the elements that can create harm? managing the risk and then communicating it. Because we can't manage it all, dams don't eliminate floods. Our job is also to communicate with organizations, schools, state and local agencies, and emergency management agencies to make sure that accurate, timely, and clear information is available, that we are transparent about what we do and what we know, and that we empower the people downstream to take part in their own risk reduction. Who has a 30-day kit in the garage for an earthquake? Really? Cool, you're one of me. <laughs> I'm one of those risk wonks. So there is a picture of the spillway gate at Gavin's Point Dam, uh, not far from Omaha, Nebraska, climbing inspections of the gate at Detroit Dam, and then emergency management agencies actually exercising the emergency action plans. We don't know if they work until we actually test them with scenarios. So that's one of the things I, I participate in. So those three things are really kind of the key to my work. Um, the map on the right, the three red bars and the three largest core reservoirs, um, all three in my portfolio, Lucky me. Um, <laughs> if any one of those dams were, was full of water, the reservoirs was full and the dam was to fail, the impacts would be felt as far downriver as New Orleans and the Gulf of Mexico. So we work really, really hard. And those dams are big. Garrison Dam is two miles across. Anybody been at Garrison Dam? It's big. Uh, a tool that you all can use if you want to find out where you live and what's around uh, the National Inventory of Dams. We actually talk about what risks uh, you um, are posed to the area by buildings, by people, by daytime or nighttime. Daytime or nighttime because sometimes it's a metropolitan area that empties out at night, so your risk is lower at night. Not that we want you to you know, necessarily leave, but that helps us know what kind of a response we have to put in place. Um, and also how many buildings or structures could be in the way. You can enter a dam. Uh, most, not all the information is there yet, but that is Cherry Creek Dam in Denver. If something were to happen, you can follow the inundation levels all the way down the South Platte into Omaha on that, um, that database and see how deep the water is and where it will go. So that you can do for Detroit Dam, you can do that for most everything here. I'm working on this graphic, so pardon if it's not really visible or clear. 
Fort Randall Dam, one of the big six in the upper Missouri, um, is actually built to hold a whole lot more than anybody locally has ever seen before. And this is pretty typical, <coughs> perhaps in the Willamette <coughs> areas that have been taxed through floods. The number on the left is 160,000 cubic feet per second. That is basically basketballs or so rushing through both the, um, out, the outlet, like the tunnels for the um, hydropower plant and the spillway. The outlet tunnels can only handle 128,000 cubic feet per second of water. So we opened up the spillway during that flood in 2011. The dam itself is built to release 633,000 cubic feet per second. So in 2011, when people thought they were seeing the big flood, in 2019, they thought they were seeing a bigger flood. What they were seeing was only a fraction of what that dam is capable of holding and then having to release at certain times in order to avoid the dam from failing, to keep it from collapsing. Because it holds it too long, it becomes too saturated, we have to let the water go. That also does not include uncontrolled water from other dams and tributaries in the area. So that's the kind of messages that we're trying to send to people is, we're doing the best we can, but we can't eliminate it all. And you may not be around to see that, but your kids might. And you thought 2011 was big, but sorry, we got bad news for you. But mm -hmm. bad news does not get better with time. So we want people to have plenty of time to plan their escape route. So flood risk management is a shared responsibility. I'm the blue bubble. We all are the yellow bubble. Our state and federal partners like Bonneville Power and others are the purple bubble. And our local partners, the Multnomah County Drainage District mm -hmm. on Marine Drive, for example, are local partners in reducing our flood risk. And that is the gist of the PowerPoint part. Those are our happy park rangers out at Bonneville Dam. That is Bonneville Dam spilling water in the spring to help support the migration of spring Chinook up the Columbia Basin. So whenever you're out there, it's not necessarily because the water's too high, but we need to get more water downstream to support fish migration. So, okay. Stop sure. Stop sure. We can leave that pleasant. Oh, no, they want to see everybody. Great. Right. Okay, some questions. Go ahead, Brandon. Much of the West is in a historic drought right now. Can mm -hmm. you talk about what the core is doing in relation to that to address that? Need to make it rain. Well, <laughs> but managing the water that's there, I and mean, a lot of that has right. to do with the reservoirs. Mm -hmm. So, um, every one of our reservoirs and then the reservoir systems, like the Willamette is 13 dams manages a system, has what they call a water control manual. It basically says when and where and how will we release water from which dam or system of dams to balance the downstream and upstream needs of what's there. Each water control manual has different scenarios such as mass flooding and dire drought. So we will manage according to that approved flood control manual, or excuse me, water control manual. I don't know exactly what each of the operators of the dams are doing right now. I do know that the operations project manager for the Willamette dams, he's likely having daily briefings as he usually does during flood or drought to check with other agencies to find out that we're all meeting the needs for downstream communities. Salem is a big recipient of water out of our system. How is Salem doing? How are their field wells doing? Do we need to put more water in? How are the fish doing? So many, many factors will go into that. We don't do as much water supply from our projects as the Bureau of Reclamation does, which is really their mission, which is water supply and irrigation. So they're gonna have a bigger um, role with the farmers and the irrigate, the mass farmers and irrigators, Idaho, wheat country, they will have a bigger role and we will work with them to make sure we get them what they, how we balance that out. Mm -hmm. Columbia dams are basically a tri-agency collaboration between Reclamation, Bonneville Power, and the Corps, because we have to keep the lights on too. So we need enough water to put through the turbines, we need enough water for fish, we need enough water for water supply and irrigation, municipal uses. So these water control manuals are the balancing books, just like your account books. 
Um, and all over the core, all over the country, there's different approaches depending on the type of drought. It's very difficult to talk about flood risk during a drought though. Because people want to know where the water's coming from, not how much they might get someday. They're dreaming of those. Yeah. Well, I'm seeing on TV ads for uh, keeping, keeping the, could be on TV. Yeah. <laughs> I'm seeing on television ads uh, for uh, keeping dams and how much good they do and so forth, sort of like what you presented, but only 30 seconds. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm wondering who's paying for those? Is that uh, the core paying for that? And it's probably in response to these groups that are trying to get rid of dams. So, uh, can you talk about uh, any of that? Sure, on behalf of Jim, I would do that. <laughs> um, those are not paid for by the Corps. Uh, they cannot be paid for by the Corps. It's illegal for us to do advertising like that. Um, so no, th those are not Corps ads. They are most likely from the pro-hydro groups, the irrigation groups, and the navigation uh, industry. And I cannot remember the name right now. Northwest River Partners and the, there's a couple of, consortiums of river and water users that are trying to balance the information from the pro-fish anti-dam folks. So we're definitely in the middle. I spent about nine of my years specifically on the fish projects, trying to figure out how to tell the story based on good word, bad word, reputation, Facebook, all those different things. So is it the fish groups that are primarily opposed to the dam? The fish groups, the tribes, um, but the tribes also understand the economic value that the dams can bring based on the navigation and the crops and the irrigation and the ability to move goods up and down the river. There are some comparison charts that you can go to for how many trucks and semis it takes to move the same load a barge can take down the river. Barges are nearly uh, climate impact free. I mean, nothing ever is, but you float down the current you don't use a lot of gas. You cruise on the 84 and you put hundreds and thousands of semis on 84 and you can evaluate the risks from that um, without a lot of data. <laughs> so it's a huge debate. Um, it would take, it really does take an act of Congress for us to take those dams out. And Congress has not indicated any interest uh, to date. One more question. Oh. <laughs> Oh, I'll, I'll be around. Too, Go ahead. No, no, no problem. Uh, you mentioned earlier that the last time there was a, a flood, it was like they didn't have the technology as much. How far has technology come to be able to manage all these pieces together and communicate with each other? Oh my goodness, tremendous. I, I'm not the, the radio wonk, but there are computer data systems, server systems, radio towers, everywhere that are, we can even manually or remotely operate some of these dams now based on flow here, we can change this dam here. We used to have to have people staying at the dams 24 seven and now we can operate them out of one control room. And then of course there's all the technology to monitor the dam and ensure that it's holding and isn't going to collapse or isn't getting too saturated. So you think of the most modern technology for this, it's there, yeah. Thank you. Yeah.